This is Bonnie Zima Dowd, and I am interviewing Theron, aka Brock Schmaltz. And the interview is taking place at the Hatfield Legion in Hatfield, Massachusetts. And today is July 22nd, 2019. The purpose of this interview is to include it in the Hatfield Vietnam Veterans Oral History Project, which was made possible through a grant. So we're delighted to have Brock with us here today. And before we begin, can you just give us your full name, please? Yes, it's uh, Theron Brock Schmaltz. And when were you born? I was born in November 1948, November the 24th. And can you tell us why you joined the services? Oh gosh, that's a that's a big question. Um, see, my dad was in the military for twenty years, mm -hmm. and all three of his sons were in the service. My oldest brother was in the Marine Corps and was a fighter pilot. My younger brother was in the Navy and was a cook and became a supply officer. I was in the Navy and was in the Seabees, which was construction uh, battalion mm -hmm. that did work either in the States as a Department of Public Works or overseas was a construction battalion. Mm -hmm. And you were in the Navy and yes. the Air Force as well? Yes, that's correct. Yep. Mm -hmm. and. How does that happen? Do you transfer between services? No. Um, I was in the, when I got out of the Navy in 1970, um, I wanted nothing more to do with any military period. Um, we went to, um, I went back into the Navy because a couple of fellas that I worked with um, and ha I had similar longings for the camaraderie mm -hmm. that I had when I was in the Navy the first time. And um, unfortunately, that didn't, that didn't transpire. Um, a friend of mine um, said, well, why don't you join the Air Guard? And uh, so I did some talking. And at the time, the Air Guard had a try one program. So if you didn't like it, you could leave. So I signed up for that try one and never left. I just kept re-signing. Yep. So 23 years later, I retired. That's a long time. It yes, is. Yes. It is, definitely. And where were your assignments, Brock? Um, well, see, the, the Air Guard I had, um, I was stationed at, in uh, Westfield, mm -hmm. and then we did trips for deployments um, all over the world, basically. All over Europe and uh, the United States, as far north as Alaska and as far south as we went into uh, Central America and did some interesting projects. You've seen the world. Well, yes, considering, you know, my dad was in the military for 20 years and we were with him from the get-go, mm -hmm. so. Um, mm -hmm. It was always an interesting career. Not always the best place to stay, but it was always interesting. And you were 18 when you volunteered? Oh, yeah, no, I was actually 17, and my, um, my mother signed papers, and I went in. As soon as I turned 18, they, they started a clock, and I was, uh, yeah, I was in boot camp when I was 18 years old, yep. And had you by then graduated from high school? Oh, yeah, I was, um, I had graduated the year before, so I was mm -hmm. only, only just barely 16 and a half when I graduated high school. Mm -hmm. um. And did you have any idea what you wanted to do when you enlisted? Hmm, yeah, um, well, I, I really, I really was um, in, interested in getting into, um, power control for nuclear submarines uh, or um, air traffic control. Mm -hmm. um, but I had a vision deficiency and that cut me out of those. But 
fortunately, it let me get into the uh, CVs, mm -hmm. and I was in a, uh, um, I was an electrician, uh, construction electrician. Mm -hmm. And CB, uh, I, as I as I understand, stands for Construction Battalion. That's right. That's right. And what was your training like to become an electrician? Well, I went to um, I went to an A school, which is the basics of electrical training um, down in. Uh, Pro not Providence, but south of Providence, Rhode Island, um, in at Davisville, Rhode Island, and I spent six or seven months going through a pretty um, accelerated program to get me up to speed, so that if I needed to know something, they were giving it to us. Um, <clears throat> To regress a little bit, I had I had done electrical work before I went into the Navy. I had I had worked with a an electrician, um, my uncle. So you so had some experience. I did. I had a lot of experience in uh, controls and that sort of thing. And what was boot camp like prior to attending the technical piece of your training? Uh, um, boot camp was. Boot. I mean, it was, it was not the best. And I, you know what? I mean, you had to go through it. Everybody did. Um, some made it, and most, yeah, most made it. A couple people didn't conform. Um, it wasn't. It was. It was a long twelve weeks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so, when you became an electrician, was that because? They had tested you for those uh, skills? Oh, sure. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. Yep. So you're very fortunate, yeah. <laughs> well, yes. And did you also receive some training with weapons other than electrical training? Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And what when, kind? What kind of weapons? Um, well, we, we started off with the M14 and... Uh, we, we were qualified to shoot um, expert, I was anyway, um, and expert with the M16. Um, we, had, uh, we had experiences with um, grenade, uh, M79 grenade launcher, which looked like a big shotgun. Mm -hmm. um, we had we had uh, M60 machine gun that we that we uh, had for um, for protection, basically. Um, we were never uh, involved in actual um, offensive combat. We were always defensive. Mm -hmm. So. But the only thing that we might do was um, stay up late and, and go out on the perimeter and, and be on a guard mm -hmm. post of some I, sort. But mm -hmm. other than that, and I never did that anyway because I was, the, um, I was an electrician that got called out to fix the runway lights or to fix an asphalt plant or I was always called out for nighttime work so mm -hmm. I never got put out on a perimeter. So when you say runway lights, there was a landing strip close by? Yes. There was a landing strip that was probably a half a mile away from our company bivouac area. Um, and we had the responsibility of keeping the runway lights run uh, operational 24-7. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that, that, and this was all um, equipment that was designed to be put for a um, expeditionary type of a runway. It was not permanent. Mm -hmm. So all of our lighting was just laid out on the ground and we'd put a sandbag every 50 feet or so. So I see. <laughs> yeah. So before you got to Vietnam and started um, working on the base, when you arrived, you were 18 and what did you feel? What did you think when you first opened the door and walked into this third world country? 
Uh, well, you know, it's it's. Um, let me back up a little bit because that's not quite the way it happened. You oh. see, I had a I had a prior military. Um, I was stationed in Australia for a year and a half. Mm-hmm. So actually, when I went to Vietnam, I was twenty, and I turned twenty one in in uh, in the uh, no Quang Tri. Mm-hmm. Um, so it was a little. It was a little different than just walking in at 18. I would have mm-hmm. been, I would have been dope slapped if I'd have been 18 going over there. That would have been just way more than I could have handled. Mm-hmm. Um, see, the th- I was a single guy. I wanted some, some uh, excitement, and the place that I was stationed in Australia was not doing it for me. So I put a letter together that said, um, I'd like to volunteer for Vietnam, which was completely crazy when you think about it. Yes. Um, here I was in a, in, a, in a country where the beer was cold and um, I had a girlfriend and, you know, I was 19. Everything was right with the world. Oh, it, it, yeah, except that I didn't like being where I was. That's all. So I, I put a request in, and the request came back granted, which was, which was really terrific, except that it stated that it was granted at the end of my completion of tour of duty there. I so see. I had to fill 18 months, which was another year and a, year and a half or something. I don't know what it was, but... Um, it was a long time, mm-hmm. and then I was going to Vietnam anyway. So I don't know when I got to um, you know when I I went back to the states for advanced infantry training with the Marines at um, Port Wyneme, California, and uh, Camp Lejeune, and they um, and they taught us how to do um, evasion. Escape and evasion stuff, and um, it was just one day right after another of of keeping you trying to keep you alive if you got into the mm-hmm. stuff. Pretty intensive. Very. Yeah. Very intensive. Um, we when when we got to Vietnam, see what they had done is when they originally when they originally put troops into Vietnam, they all went there as a unit. Mm -hmm. Um, If it was a battalion, it would be 1,200 guys. And you all knew each other. Mm -hmm. But by the time I got into Vietnam, that was in 69, they had changed that program, and they were just backfilling spaces. So you were assigned a... Uh, a position as as your career field, but it was with a com- it was a battalion that you had no idea mm-hmm. where it was mm-hmm. or who was there, and so you got you got dropped in the middle of the stuff and you were like a babe in the woods. No friends, no buddies. No friends, nothing. And you know, I was in Da Nang the first day or two before I rotate or went up to the company that I was going to in uh, Quang Tri in Dong Ha, and uh, <clears throat> I was up on the second deck looking out over the, the camp, and I just said, wow, what the hell did I just get myself into, because I just had no, mm-hmm. I was just young and dumb, and it was uh, pretty scary when, you yeah. think, when I think about it now, 50 years later, holy mackerel. <laughs> <laughs> so what was the hardest part of being over there? I, I guess trying to get through one day at a time. Mm-hmm. Um, trying to make friends, if you could. Um, trying to stay alive. Mm-hmm. Um, because even though we weren't in a combative type of environment, we... Still got rockets and uh, and mortars and people shot at us, so it it was still a combat zone. Mm. You know, you could take a round or get 
get shrapnel or all sorts of stuff. Mm. So tell me what a typical day was like for you. Um, you know, the, the typical days that we had were um, we, we were um, staying in plywood hooches. Um, you slept, we did have a cot. Excuse um, me, with a mattress. Can, what's a hooch? A hooch is a house. Okay, thank and you. And <laughs> it's made out of plywood. Um, it was made. It was designed so that they didn't have to cut plywood in order to put the thing together. So everything used a four by eight sheet of plywood, either end to end or side to side, or you know, even. And then it had a tin roof. Um, it was interesting. You know, we used to put diesel fuel on the floor to keep down the ants and the insects. So, um, if how you... Ma- how many of you were in a hooch together? Probably about 10 mm-hmm. or maybe more, 12. Mm-hmm. Depended, I guess. Um, they, uh, uh, you know, in, and the, the hooch that I got, that I went into, everybody was an electrician. So... Um, yeah, we were part of Bravo Company. Everybody was an electrician. We had uh, we had a refrigerator, which was pretty cool. Yeah. And um, and we could we used to do a lot, spend a lot of our time um, trading for stuff that we couldn't get. That Give me it, an example. Um, say like the Navy couldn't get us um, poncho liners; just wasn't in their inventory. So we would talk to the people from the army and trade them something like a roll of wire for mm-hmm. something um you know i mean we traded away two air conditioners for a jeep um <laughs> you know it it was just it that's just the way things were over there if you didn't have it you went out and got it mm-hmm. and or, or or traded it stuff away for it you know mm-hmm. whatever you might have extra mm-hmm. so if you had a job coming up and you needed something like a bottle of bourbon or something, you plan to have an extra roll of wire so you could take it to the Army and trade it for them. I love it. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, no, where there's a will, there's a way. Yeah, yeah. Yep. So you were doing that during work hours? Oh, or? sure. Yes, okay. Oh, yeah. And so what did you do when you weren't working and you were off? And... Oh. Um, you know, there was a... Um, we had a, a basketball court. We had... Um, we had um, we played baseball I guess um, you know and, the, and our main ag- main drive was long enough and wide enough so you could play football down the oh. down the driveway mm-hmm. you know um, we worked seven six and a half days a week um, Sunday was a half a day and then I worked at night when they'd call me out so right we were pretty busy. Mm-hmm. If we did any recreational stuff, it would have been at the NCO club drinking beer, <laughs> or and, or not. Yeah, you know. right. And did you and the fellows that you lived with become good friends or colleagues? Um, I, yeah, I guess we did. We became close um, up to a point. Mm-hmm. Um, there was only one one kiddo or one fella, yeah, one fella that I knew. Larry McDaniel's was from Washington State. He and I were close. Um, and then uh, he uh, he rotated back to the states about halfway through my mm-hmm. tour of duty, and then I was out to lunch again with some with nobody you know Mm -hmm. so it was it was interesting have you looked him up ever since you got back to oh yeah yeah oh yes yeah because i went back there in 1970 to get discharged um and i i had um checked into the navy um i i got back to the states on the third or fourth of july um, and I was set to be discharged from the, the uh, naval facility in Washington, and uh, they had 
something like this was in 1970 so there were a lot of guys getting out of the military mm -hmm. they had a lot of backlog mm. of people getting out and they told me that I'd be there for four or five weeks and I said shit man I can't wait four or five weeks <laughs> right. I gotta have this happen today now. <laughs> yeah no now is better yeah today okay tomorrow all right but you know, we have to make this thing move. Yes. And they said, well, you, the only place you can do that is at the Fargo building in Boston. I know just where that is, so get me, cut me a travel request, and, and I'm on my way. So I never saw Dan, uh, Daniels again mm -hmm. after that. I went home, packed my bags, said goodbye to Louise, and I was on an airplane to Boston. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. It was fun. <laughs> so... When you were over there, did you think about family, friends? Did you write letters? Um, I, I wrote letters. I wrote letters to my mother. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know where they are anymore. Um, I know she kept them for a while. Um, I wrote letters to Larry McDaniel's sister-in-law. And I can't tell you what her name is anymore either. Um, but she wrote back and forth and just to, you know, get a different perspective mm -hmm. from a young young woman's point of view. Um, and that was that was about all I, I had to for communication with the folks um, was letters back and forth. Mm hmm. Was it comforting to receive a letter from home? Oh, yeah. 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 At least you knew you were still part of the you know part of the family, family right it was uh yeah i didn't i i looked forward to see receiving mail mm -hmm. you know yeah. it was it was a good thing mm -hmm. and when you were there in vietnam did you ever do any civic work did you help the communities that were living close to the base perhaps or families that Needed some assistance. Well, you know, we did. Um, we had a um, we had an orphanage that we went down to and did work at. Um, you know, made it better uh, mm -hmm. because they didn't have they had no resources whatsoever. So we would go down there every once in a while and put things together so that they had a roof over their heads that was. Mm -hmm. solid and wasn't gonna you know and put them put a building together for them so that they would be up off the ground and more or less weather tight um, but it was uh, yeah that had to be a very moving and touching experience to see these children who didn't have a home and who weren't being cared for properly well, you know the thing. The thing of it was is that a lot of them, a lot of the kids that we saw, were American GIs kids that mm -hmm. had been born, mm -hmm. and the the guys had probably rotated back to the states. Um, so there was there was always um, that type of. Mm -hmm. relationship and so you so you you felt for them right you know yeah yeah you felt for them right yeah, yeah. Mm. so we talked about recreational activities and we talked mm -hmm. about connecting with home um and we talked about what your day was like what about uh food and uh health care and Oh, well, you know, at, at 19, 20, 21 years old, you don't need a whole lot of health care. <laughs> I guess uh, that's true. <laughs> that, you know, and, and it, um, you know, it was three, three hots in, in a bot, in a cot, <laughs> right? You, know, you got breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and if you wanted to go for midnight rations, you could go then, too. But um, it, it was... It was food. It was, you know, Navy is the only branch of the service back then that actually sent their cooks to school so that they learned 
how to be a cook. I didn't know oh, that. Oh yeah, no kidding. And and the um, you know, and it's it's frightening what these people put up with in the other branches of the service. The Marines had no cooks. If you were if you were near to well, you'd be a cook. If you couldn't go, you know, I mean, you could stand there and, and peel potatoes or clean, you know, be a pot, pot walloper mm -hmm. or something like that. The Army was even worse. The Air Force was even, was better, but, oh yeah. I didn't oh. realize that, wow. Oh yeah, <laughs> without a doubt. And, you know, and, and it was a, you know, we all did our part to, to help improve ourselves. And mm -hmm. um, I can remember going in at, I was working nights, and the cook was passed out, and I just grabbed a, a spatch and started flipping eggs on the grill because guys were hungry, I was hungry, and I wanted to eat. So, yeah. you know, just picked up where somebody left off and mm -hmm. just did the job. Yeah, yeah. So, um, but it, it just... You know, we got calls as an electrician. I got got a trouble call to go out and fix. Um, you know what a steam table is? No. A steam table is a piece of kitchen equipment that might be six, eight feet long, mm -hmm. and it has a um, reservoir of hot water. Mm -hmm. And you'd put food into a some like a chafing dish on top of it, and some of them are oil fired and some are electric some have types of heaters that you put into them and some you just plug into a heavy duty cable mm -hmm. the army called up and said we got, or maybe it was the marines i don't remember it doesn't matter they called up and said we got problems with our steam table it doesn't work so we got in a truck drove up it was about 20 miles away and uh which was a typical problem um, because we were on traveling on Route 1, had to wait until the morning when they went and cleared the mines off the road. So, you know, I mean, it wasn't a five-minute task. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and they had lit a kerosene heater under this electrically heated steam table. So they, they had no idea what they were doing to begin with. Mm -hmm. We had the same type of things with generators. They'd call us up and say, you know, we've got a generator here that's not working. Well, the problem with it was is, is they had not checked the oil on it, and one of the rods for a piston had come through the side of the diesel generator. When you look into it further, it wasn't their generator to begin with. They'd stolen it. So, you know... So this is the type of thing that you do every day, day yeah. in, day out. It's just, <laughs> so you're fixing somebody's lunacy about uh, cooking, and then you're fixing a generator that doesn't belong to them. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, some nights I would be, be, oh, I'd be up for 10 or 12 hours keeping a generator running because the, um, the, the uh, controls on it were, were going bad. So I would be sitting right next to the damn thing and would bump it every once in a while to keep it the RPMs up so that the perimeter lights wouldn't go out at 2 o'clock in the morning or 3 or whenever. But that was, you know, or I'd be climbing up poles out on the perimeter, replacing lamps 30 feet in the air uh, with hooks because that was the only way to get up the pole. Mm. So the minute you had the light back on you were quickly down the pole oh, a couple for sure two or three steps maybe <laughs> but it was you know i mean that's just just a typical thing they take it for granted that that's what we were doing mm -hmm. yeah so in in the course of that were you listening to music were you um yeah we would we would listen to the doors yeah and um what was the most iconic song that you remember oh, from? I can't remember the names of it, but it was uh, something about Dino Light My Fire or um, something like that. Or, or there was one about um, uh, who, who was singing out uh, the, the 
the house in New Orleans, the house, oh, of, the the rising house of the sun. rising sun. That yes. was another favorite one. Um, when you hear those songs today, oh, does yeah. it take oh, you right back? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Yep. The um, and you know that the uh, the movie that came out with uh, um, who was it? Uh, Robbins, Robin Williams. Mm-hmm. Um, Good Morning Vietnam. Yes, it was terrific. I love that movie. Yes, I just love that movie. Um, and was it pretty real to compared to what you were experiencing? I think so. Yeah, mm-hmm. I think so. I mean, there, there was a lot of stuff that I didn't get exposed to mm. um, because of the situation where we were. Um, when if, if you talk to a to a, to a vet today, and you tell them where you were, they they would say, oh yeah, you really were in the shit. And then you'd talk to them and say, you know, where were you? And they would say, well, we were down in the, in the, in the, D- uh, no, down in the, uh, down in the Delta. Well, we, I don't know, we must have all been getting the hammered the same way because they were always saying, oh yeah, you guys were getting hammered. And we would say, yeah, no, you guys were getting the, you know. Yeah. Um, How did you sleep? How did you rest? You were exhausted. Yeah. You were absolutely exhausted. You were working 12-hour days or longer. Mm-hmm. You know, you worked until the day was done. And so it was definitely, you'd, you'd fall into bed, mm-hmm. you know, and, and just be out. Right. You know. Yeah. Did you ever get some chance to escape and take a short respite to um, yeah. recoup and refresh? And- yeah. Well, we got... Um, we got what they called an in-country R&R, which um, a friend of mine and I, we went down to uh, Cameron Bay, which was down by, um, let me look at this map here. It was down near um, Saigon, not too far from Saigon, I guess. Um, and it was a beach. We had a place that you could stay, and you weren't, didn't get rockets at night. You didn't get mortared. You didn't get shot at. You just mm-hmm. went to the beach, drank beer, and ate. You know, um, and then I went to um, when I when I went for out country R and R. I went to uh, Japan for six days. But um, and the reason I was in Japan was because my dad was stationed there for four years, so it had been. See, we had left Japan in 61, and I was back in Japan in 69, so it was about eight years later, you know. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. And we got to see, um, we got to see Bob Hope. Oh, you do did? His, oh, yeah. <laughs> do his, um, do his uh, Christmas show. Mm-hmm. It was terrific. Was there had to be thousands of men oh and women. Oh my gosh, yeah. yeah. I've got a picture in here about yeah. it. Oh yeah, it's just it was a big amphitheater and he this was one of about 20 sites that he had gone to. Mm-hmm. And there probably was 20 or 30 guys, 1000 guys there. Yeah. You know, people were up hanging off the of telephone poles and it was just just wild. Yeah. And how long did he perform? I, I'll bet he was. I'll bet he was there for three or four hours. Mm-hmm. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, it was an it was an all day truck ride down to um, to Fubai where he was, and then you know, so it was um, twenty four hours. Mm-hmm. Well, by the time we left in the morning, till we got back that night. Well, worth it, don't you think? Oh, without <laughs> a doubt, without a doubt. Yep. Yep. So now let's talk about when you came home. <laughs> okay. How, what was the reaction when you came home? How, how did you feel when you came home? Um, you know, it, it's um, not hard, I guess, to say that, that um, it felt like we weren't very well received. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, but you know, you didn't have anything to compare it to. Compare it to. Um, we knew that we were getting 
the short end of the stick, I think. Um, at that time, there was a, a real big movement to um, just end the war, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and I hadn't been involved in the politics of it. I was just a young kid doing doing their duty, mm -hmm. you know. Do, it was just what we did. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I had a, a good buddy of mine was in the Marines. He got killed when he was 17 or 18. Um, I'm sorry. Yeah, it was a hard one. Yeah. How did you transition back into... Um, Life in the States, post-war. Um, I, I could have become an alcoholic mm -hmm. in a very short period of time. Mm -hmm. um, used that a lot. Um, but I, I recognized the problem and uh, got out of that spiral. Um, I, I got a... I got a um, what the hell? I got a... I got a job as an electrical apprentice, mm -hmm. um, so that helped mm -hmm. get me through. Right. You know, I so I got back into the electrical career field and never left. I'm right there, right to this day, I'm still working in the in the career that I love. Mm -hmm. Yep. Did, have you ever been down to Washington D.C. to see? Oh, yes. Yeah. Yep. Tell me about that. Hmm. It's um. It's um. It's hard to talk about that um, when you look at that monument and you realize that there are fifty-eight thousand people listed that never came home, mm. never saw the kids. Never went, uh, never, never got to say goodbye. Um, well, it's the same thing with their, with their parents, you know, or their girlfriends or their wives or whatever. Um, that was hard, real hard one. Um, so it's, uh, it makes, makes you choke up. Um, cause we had some, we had some guys in our, in the battalion that I was in that that got killed over in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. um, not combat, well, I don't know. Um, stupid things mm -hmm. that could have been avoided. Mm -hmm. um, but this, this, the safety aspect of what we did and what we do is, um, is, hard because they they could have been more safety conscious mm -hmm. um, you know I mean OSHA wasn't even around back then it was brought into into being shortly after that because of the Be loss of life and mm -hmm. you know and and the problems that we have in our everyday workplaces mm -hmm. um, we had a kid get get killed be at, at drowning uh, you know I mean he tried to walk down a road to our water point and his his fatigues got caught on the barbed wire and he went you know I mean nobody saw where he went down they knew he was gone underwater but we couldn't find him mm. you know when the water when but the problem was is that the river rose because it rained up in the hills our the river rose and he was part of the crew to work on the pumps and all. Um, we had another kiddo who was um, committed suicide. He just couldn't mm -hmm. stand the, the, the stress, I guess. Mm -hmm. You know, you never know why. I don't, I don't know why. It's, you know, I didn't think it was that bad, but I'm not him. Right. You Every know, individual is different. You can't, no. you can't be questioning why. No. It just, that's what happens. Um, another guy that was running down the road at 40 miles an hour on a, in a heavy earth moving device and he didn't have a seat belt on. And he got, you know, thrown out of the seat and in front of the vehicle and the, the, 
that the vehicle ran o- over him. So, mm-hmm. you know, these are things that could have been permit- prevented, mm-hmm. um, some of them, um, you know. But I pulled the kid off of the, off of the, the high-voltage lines um, because he was in the Army, but he didn't, he didn't belong up where he was at. Mm-hmm. You know, we had specific guidelines that we, ca- we followed. In mm-hmm. the Seabees, we knew what we were doing when we climbed a pole. And you stayed away from that stuff because we were working. Um, it wasn't high voltage like we have around here today, but it was 4160, and it'll kill you. Just pure and simple. Um, so it was hard to do, you know, to see somebody waste their lives mm-hmm. or get get wasted. You know, we didn't have. I, I'd imagine that we had some people that got injured on the perimeter, but I don't remember many that mm-hmm. got hurt that mm-hmm. way, yeah. you know. But we had eight or nine different areas of operation, so they may have had somebody get hurt somewhere mm-hmm. else, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? Right. Whether it's in combat or whether it's accidental, you know, the loss of a life That's is right. sad. It's that, Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And when you, you returned, were you struggling with your emotions and um, oh, experiencing yeah. some maybe post traumatic stress syndromes? Without a doubt. Yes. Without a doubt. Yep. We went to, um, oh no, I went to, uh, I went to counseling for about three years. Um, you know, I was married for the first the first time I was married for twenty four years. But it wasn't it wasn't easy. Um and I wasn't in the right mind. Mm-hmm. Um but you know, I got I got right eventually. But it was it was hard to talk about and discuss of course. it. Yeah. 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 What advice do you have for today for any young men or women signing up for the service? <laughs> um be careful mm-hmm. be be careful and be be smart and um you know it just uh when i was in the air guard i uh, this was before uh just after 9-11 and I said, you know, I got to go up and see the flight surgeon. I was feeling like mm-hmm. things needed to be said. And I made an appointment. I went up and I said, um, you know, I'm a vet. I'm a Vietnam vet. Mm-hmm. Post-traumatic stress. Been there, done that. These kids that are potentially going into combat or into a into an area where people don't like them, they need to have some some help and protection mm-hmm. and um he said no we're we got that covered and i thought well you just gave me the fast shuffle and that because you don't want to deal with it right but yeah. but it's um yeah it's it's very sad yes so you know it's just um we're doomed to repeat mm-hmm if we don't learn from yeah. our past. Right, right. So when you returned, how old were you when you came back to the States? I was 21. You were 21? Yep. And how did that experience change you? Did you come back smarter, uh, wiser, not as naive? Oh, without a doubt, not as naive. <laughs> I'm not sure it was any wiser. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the 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 problem that you have is that there's nobody around here that you could talk to mm-hmm. or that had any experience similar to what you had mm-hmm. they just it just didn't exist um, so you just had to deal with it the best you could um, and there's a lot of there's a lot of guys here in the legion that 
would tell you the same thing, mm -hmm. that there just wasn't anybody around that you could talk to. Mm -hmm. Now, I mean, there just wasn't the, 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 um, there, there wasn't the pers people trained mm -hmm. to deal with that type of a, a vet problem. Mm -hmm. um, so you, you just lived with it, mm -hmm. basically. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, because I never went, I never went up to the VA mm -hmm. to get any kind of counseling or anything like that. I went to a private. Um, gentleman mm -hmm. that I dealt with mm -hmm. so um, yeah and what do you say to your kids when they ask you can you tell me about your experiences do you talk about it um, you know every once in a while I'll I'll talk about it uh, but it's it's not something that I bring up mm -hmm. usually mm -hmm. um, my, I have a son who's 17 um, he has um, he has Crohn's, mm -hmm. so that would put him out of contention for mm -hmm. any military service. Um, my um, my oldest son is thirty three or thirty four, and I I would have almost taken an ice pick and poked his ear somehow in order to keep him out of the military. Mm -hmm. I just you know. When you think about the time that we put in, my father did 20 years, my brother did 20 years, I did 23, and my older brother did six. We're here, and um, we served, mm -hmm. I think we all served with honor, mm -hmm. um, but I think we've done enough. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, it's time for somebody else to step up and do their thing. Mm -hmm. You know, because yeah. I guess there's what one or two percent of the population actually actively participate in the military. Mm -hmm. That's a pretty small percentage yeah. when you think about it. It is, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's and it's kind of, you know, this legion here. They got a lot of kids into the Marines. I don't care about the Marines that much, but. They're they're participating and and they're they're young and um, they're learning. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, I I have to take my hat off to them. Mm -hmm. They're participating. Mm. So as a vet, do you find community here at the American Legion with other vets? Oh yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Yep. Wouldn't um, yeah, and and I. You know, I, I was in, in the Air Guard down at Westfield for 22 or 23 years, and I found the, the family there mm -hmm. that I was missing when I came back from right. Vietnam and all of that. Um, and that's why I stayed as long as I did. Um, also, it got, away, it got, got me away from my ex-wife. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. It's um, <laughs> having yeah. community is so important. Oh, without a yeah. doubt. Yes, yeah. I agree. And it was, you know, there was there was a few guys in the guard that had been in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. um, some of the mechanics, some of the pilots. So I got along with them. I got along with a lot of the the enlisted people. Um, but by and large. Um, the people that were in the Air Guard, or in the Naval Reserves for that matter, mm -hmm. they were there because they didn't want to go into the regulars. They mm -hmm. they didn't mind going and taking taking the money and and, right. and getting the college educations and whatever else they could get out of it, but they didn't want to be on active duty mm -hmm. and get shot at. Um, that's the same reason that um, George Bush the second or third or whatever, you know, he's did the same thing. He got into the guard. Yeah. So. <laughs> Before we close, is there anything else that you want to share with the listeners? <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope that whoever listens to this is um, 
entertained. I hope that they, they learn something and that um, people that, that try harder and smarter and be, be smarter about what they do and how they do it and be aware of what the political ramifications are. Mm -hmm. When I was 19 or 18 years old, I had no clue what politics were. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and it plays such a value, uh, an important piece. Yes, of without war. a doubt. Without yes. a doubt. Without a doubt. And that's why, when I was talking to people and saying, you know, we're going to get into it in Iraq, just like we did in Vietnam, and. They said, no, 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 we're not going to do that. And I said, yeah, we are. We're doing exactly the same crap that we did 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, you can say what you want, but we just kept on fueling the fire, mm -hmm. unfortunately. Yes, yes. Well, thank you for oh, sharing wow. your story with us today, Thank Brock. you for having yeah. me. Thank you, especially for your years of service. More importantly, your family's years of service. I mean, that almost adds oh, yeah. up to a century. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a long time. Yeah. Yeah. It was, um, yeah. Yep, between all of us, 60, 70 years. Yeah. Yeah. It speaks well for where your heart is and where... Oh yeah, what you believe in? Oh, yeah. thank you. Yeah, and then and I, you know, I enjoy the company that I have here. Mm -hmm. um, so, well, thank you, Brock, and that's uh, that's all we have to say for now. Okay, well, that's a good one. <laughs> Thanks again, Brock. Oh, you're entirely welcome. Thank you. I hope I haven't disappointed you. Oh gosh, no, no, yeah, you've brought up some emotions within me. I will tell you. <laughs>